Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Guillermo Sabatia, your host uh, here at the Perspectives on Energy here in Think Tech Hawaii. And today we'll be discussing the challenges, like navigating NERC compliance challenges when it comes to integrating battery energy storage systems into existing generating facilities. So thank you again. Welcome. And uh, I am the Director of International Services at HSI. And earlier this week, we had the opportunity to actually have a webinar on the this particular topic and uh definitely looking forward to actually having more discussions on this and one of the things that uh there, there's a lot of like uh, concerns and anxiety regarding how NERC compliance is going to impact these different utilities or e even the generator owners so hopefully here we'll be able to, to kind of describe what those challenges are and how to hopefully address them as uh, we move forward all right so uh, next slide please Okay, so the integration of battery, battery energy storage systems, the BESSs, right? In this case, uh, one of the biggest issues, of course, now is the fact that if, uh, up until now, they had a uh, threshold of 75 MBA or megawatts in that case. And there was a certain, uh, I think it was 100 kV or above. Now they've lowered that threshold. NERC is make, making it 25 MBA. And it's, of course, uh, so now your your overall facility aggregate output, if it's 25 MBA or above, then you're definitely subject to these new standards, right? At the same time, you're also, uh, if you're connecting to a transmission facility that is 60 kV and above, so it used to be 100, now it's 60 kilovolts, then you're definitely now within the scope of our NERC compliance requirements. So what does this all mean, right? So um, a lot of different entities have been, have been considering whether they, they want to get into this business. Others have been thinking whether they want to divest and get out of this business. The truth is, it's really not that hard to be uh, NERC compliant. It just requires a little bit of planning, uh, understanding the NERC standards, understanding what the, what the requirements are, and uh, just getting the right, the right documentation. All right, so hopefully we'll be able to outline some of the issues that are typically encountered in these uh, particular challenges. Next slide, please. All right, so there's two different ways to um, to actually incorporate into this, right? So uh, one of the challenges is, is the, of course, a modified startup approach. Uh, when you're looking at either incorporating the BS, BESSs or the, it should be treated as a modified startup process, or you can look at it as existing facility procedures will need to be adjusted to account for the unique characteristics, right? So either it's uh, you're, you're looking at starting from scratch when it comes to installing a new facility, uh, that will be probably the, the ideal case. But if you already have something existing that's already running, it's already uh, uh, already gone commercial, then in this case, you may need to re revisit those procedures, those uh, documentation, that evidence, and be able to account for that particular uh, characteristic and those, uh, those assets. What does that even mean, right? So let's go to the next slide. So looking at the existing procedure update, right? One of the things that we're looking at here is um, understanding, right? Uh, there's different standards that are impacted. So a SIP, COM, communications, or, or TOP3. So uh, let's go through each of these, right? So uh, when it comes to SIP, of course, uh, critical infrastructure protection, you're looking at cybersecurity, uh, who has access to these sites. Now, mind you, any of these facilities that's connected to the bulk electric system, which is uh, these uh, transmission elements that tie to the general to, to the general grid, right? Uh, potentially, you could actually impact the reliability and performance of the grid in general by affecting these assets. So that's why SIP uh, standards become important, whether it's who gets training, access, uh, firewalls, uh, and pretty much everything that impacts the general facilities for, for typical generation will impact this. Now, in, that, in this case, for example, um, identifying, for example, whether you're a, you're a high impact or low impact facility, whether you're a, uh, you're a facility that, that, that is close to, a, for example, a, a larger power plant, or even close to a, to a vital transmission system, well, you know, that, that'll, that'll make you more of a medium or higher impact facility. But if you're somewhere pretty remotely far off, uh, chances are you may be a lower impact facility in this case, right? Uh, the other interesting thing here as well is that you also uh, access. If you have, for example, physical access to the facility versus cyber access, access to those facilities, those, those are things that are going to have to be examined and understood. Uh, 
in most cases, uh, you're already doing that. A lot of it is basically good housekeeping when it comes to IT and cybersecurity. Um, so you're doing the same thing when it comes to physical security, but in some of these places, right, now you may require, for example, electronic badge access, logging in, logging out, and then uh, which most places already have. Uh, just just the old day of basically just putting a simple old lock on the fence and then leaving the actual control house unlocked. It's no longer the case, but in most cases, most of us has, have like a monitored alarm system, uh, monitored uh, electronic access system. Well, most places already have that in place. So that would be an example of cybersecurity, right? Expansion of physical electronic access, right? Uh, when it comes to COM communication standards, uh, there's two of them, COM001, COM002. Uh, here, for example, you have the initial training. If you have an operator that is going to be receiving instructions from a control center somewhere else, from the balancing authority or from the reliability coordinator, you're usually a balancing authority or transmission operator. Well, they need to be trained on how to receive and, and, uh, and respond to operating instructions or how to communicate uh, with these different entities. And usually it's a protocol they follow uh, on, on three-part communication. The other thing that COM001 uh, may have the need to actually have um, testing or have uh, primary and backup training, um, back or primary or back communications uh, capabilities. Well, so they can actually have a, have a phone call or be able to be, uh, be accessed at any given time. Um, in some cases, actually just having simple emails uh, usually suffices, right? The, the, the idea is to actually have a defined uh, primary communications and then uh, maybe participate in the whole backup. Uh, most everybody has a backup co communications capability. And here, they're not even required to test them, you just require to have one. For the COM1, uh, usually all they, all they need is initial training. Uh, basically, you get training one time for the operators before they're put you know, uh, on the job and ready to receive operating instructions. So something is not that onerous. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you already have personnel on site, just adding uh, one of these uh, BESSs to your facility just may not even change anything because they already have all that training. So really all it is is training new operators. The TOP3 scope in this case is usually a data spec. Uh, what sort of data you're going to provide to your local entities, your host entity, uh, the transmission provider, or even the uh, reliability coordinator. So um, that information is usually the same thing that everybody else offers. And, and it's already telemetry that you're going to have provided on your, uh, usually all of your, uh, on your, panels in your system anyway. So the information you're going to be providing is information you want to see anyway. So that's usually already in 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 that uh, in that whole package and module that you're doing when you buy one of these new facilities. If it's an existing facility, chances are you pretty much already have that. You're just really not providing it to the local entities. Uh, so getting that up to speed shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, the other one is, uh, next slide, please. So EOP4, right, uh, usually that means event reporting. That's um, in a lot of cases, right, part of that event reporting plan. All you have to do is make sure that this new facility is included in the entity's uh, event reporting uh, procedure, whether it's a TOP or the BA. In some cases, if you're reporting, for example, say you had an incident or you had where somebody broke the fence and came in to steal stuff, or you have, for example, a problem with your facility, meaning that it's no longer available, because of damage that you would be reporting to the BA or the TOP anyway. So in this case, right, it's something you're probably already doing, but again, when it comes to the EOP4, that's something that you're going to be working with when it, your, your local transmission provider or your balancing authority to make sure you have that ready. Uh, EOP11 is another really, really interesting, uh, uh, very timely challenge in, in this case because mo most facilities, for example, have had issues with winterization. Uh, we just had like a recent freeze in the mainland uh, a couple of it was the last couple of weeks. Now in Hawaii, that's not really a problem, right? In fact, most facilities in Hawaii aren't even subject to this whole presentation because of the fact that you know you don't have any NERC standards out there. How, however, uh, you do have some IEEE and FERC and Department of Energy requirements that are usually parallels or analogs to these particular requirements, right? So going back to EOP 11, in this case, uh, 
a lot of these uh, weatherization, it just means you have to have a procedure that you've uh, developed, that you've tested, that you've trained everybody on. And one of the questions is when it comes to these particular batteries really is uh, how, what's the threshold and temperature that these devices will just uh, cease to function adequately or they're going to have issues operating, right? So that's kind of the things you need to understand. Other cases, you have problems with cooling, right? So some of these battery facilities have issues with cooling. Others actually have a salt and water, for example, that presents another problem in these in these like uh, extreme weather events. So the whole point is to make sure that you have all these parameters clearly defined, understanding what these temperature thresholds are, and to make sure that those are reported to your host balancing authorities or your host transmission operators, right? FAC1 and FAC002, this is how you interconnect to your uh, host entities. So you may be subject, you, be, you will be subject to these new, uh, well, these, these old standards that have been around for a while, but all that is really is how you interconnect. Now, the fact of the matter is that if you're already an existing facility, chances are you already have all of that done and you have paperwork to prove it, it's important that you have paperwork to prove it. Otherwise, you may need to get for yourself some updates with your local transmission operator and transmission owner, right? Same thing with the balancing authorities, right? Understanding what, what the, uh, how they are, how they were notified of your output uh, when it comes to megawatt MVA uh, and the real reactive power capabilities to your, to your different host uh, entities. Next slide, please. Okay, the next one, vegetation management, right? So um, if you're already hooked up to a transmission facility, chances are you're there. that's already being managed for you. But if you own the transmission assets, if you own the transmission line that connects your facility to another transmission area, then you will be uh, subject to that particular uh the standard and the requirements they're in. Uh, so uh, transmission management, uh, vegetation manager really is just a matter of you know, making sure you you uh, you follow the, uh, the guidance when it comes to maintaining uh, vegetation away from the transmission right away. So in this case, it becomes a problem. Now, when it comes to substations, right, you may have, you of course have to maintain the perimeter or that substation to prevent uh, vegetation getting into your, your energized assets in that station. IRO 10 and TOP3, again, uh, from the previous slide, it's just what it is, is the uh, data exchange, exchange spec with the RC, the TOP, and the BA. So it's a, the reliability coordinator, you're going to share data with the, the transmission operator, and of course, the balancing authority. So IRO pertains to the RC, TOP pertains to the T TOP and BA, and there's even a BAL uh, standard in there somewhere that talks about how you share data with your balancing authorities. Uh, MLD uh, standards in this case, right? Uh, what it is really is to understand uh, all the testing that goes on with these uh, particular facilities. Uh, usually when you, when you go commercial, right? It's not when you're testing or, or connecting to the web, to the net for the first time and putting out megawatts, but rather when you go commercial, when you're actually selling those megawatts is uh, and, and, and megawatts when it's when that really matters. So at that point, you need to make sure all of your testing has been completed and you are now uh, entering your whole, what they call maintenance cycle, where it could be five, 10 years when you do all the other testing. So uh, again, all of that needs to make sure you are completed. And then of course, verification of these tests need to be completed within a year of going commercial. So my advice there usually isn't the fact that you, know, you wanna get that done you know, right around the time you go commercial before you actually do testing after the fact, because that's usually where most of the contractors leave. A lot of cases, uh, the contractors installing some of these like um, battery storage facilities are just contractors. And they're once they're done with you, they wanna rush and work on the next project after that. So it's important to make sure you put it in the contract and part of the uh, com commissioning uh, requirements that, that they provide you with the adequate documentation, adequate testing records and all that information before they you know get their final payment. So. That's something that could be incorporated into a contract to make sure you get everything you need. But they, but NERC is still pretty lenient when it comes to that whole 365 days, right? Uh, within going commercial. But in reality, it's something I don't always advise. I want to make sure I give everybody enough time uh, to make sure that, uh, that they have all the documentation and evidence ready at this point. Uh, existing procedure update, right? So uh, 
uh, the relay, the PRC is protection and control and relay standards. Here, for example, you got to make sure that you have all of your, uh, whether the loadability, you have the performance. So one of the things that they always want to know about, of course, is your ability to ride through a disturbance, whether it's a voltage or a frequency disturbance. Uh, and these, um, these uh, battery storage facilities, uh, usually now they come with the settings that are that are made according to the standard, but it's important to get those tested and make sure that they are to the latest spec, right? Um, and then, of course, um, the the other thing, of course, is, is is that they have the right documentation showing that they were tested indeed. VAR002, of course, that is your voltage schedule. Make sure that you're, if your facility is going to be able to support the voltage, whether you're putting out VARs or absorbing VARs, uh, there's a procedure in place to be able to report that. Uh, and the last one for, and as I was talking about that earlier, right, one of the issues you have there, of course, is the contractors and vendors are available huh, after commissioning date, commercial date to respond to questions. Uh, one thing I always ask for here is to make sure you have everything you need right before they get the final payment, because it gets to the point where it's, it's really difficult to track everybody down if there's a missing piece of evidence that you don't have that you need for an audit. The other important thing is that uh, I've been in a few projects where I've noticed that the contractor, all they did was they got all the test evidence, all the prints, all of the what they call station checks, where they basically get a copy of the print and they're and they're and they're basically with a colored highlighter or colored pen or pencil, they're checking off all different parts of the circuit, which is important work to do, and that's the way I used to do it when I was in the field. Problem is that all of that gets rolled into one long PDF because it, it got scanned uh, together, and then they end up giving you a huge file with no, which is not searchable. So that becomes a problem. So. My advice always is to, if they have these uh, these prints that are that are all you know, written on a sort of thing, though, that would be a whole separate file or set of files. Uh, and then the actual test records are like a nice clean PDF that's searchable. And most of the test equipment out there, test software, produce very nicely searchable um, documentation to prove to prove that your tests were successful. The other issue that we've seen is that sometimes they'll 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 get lazy or cute with some of the station names and locations, and it's important to have the station clearly identified, to have the actual asset clearly identified. If it's a certain breaker or a certain switch that you're testing, a certain panel, to make sure that panel nomenclature, that panel name, that panel information is clearly indicated in that test record, because then eventually it's an auditor could go ahead and doubt your test results that they don't match the panel you're actually being audited on. So it's important to remember that. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about PRC-5 compliance. And, and, and this, uh, as, I, as I was saying earlier, this is a, one of the bigger challenges, right? When it comes to having, but NERC has already provided you with the actual template, the actual spreadsheet to populate all of these like uh, facilities. So in this case, it's just a matter of having all the correct test evidence done for all of your relay equipment, all of your panels, and uh, in a nice and clean searchable fashion. And then of course, all of the associated uh, diagrams, right? That, that when they did their station checks, whether it's DC elementary or AC elementary, so AC is gonna be all your different uh, uh, current transformer circuits versus the DC elementary, all, all of your relaying. Oftentimes, right? Those, like I said earlier, have a lot of like uh, check marks on them where they, they were done by hand. And so that's the case, and they're scanning that as evidence for make sure you have that in a file that's not intermingled with the other uh, PDFs that, that, that need to be searchable. So very important thing. Uh, next slide, please, slide nine. Okay, so uh, one of the things that are interesting here is like if you're going to have these assets, right? Um, Integrated into your existing, for example, say you have a generating facility that has a combined cycle plants or something else, and then you're going to add this, and then you're going to connect it to this one of the same buses, and then become an integrated system. If it's going to be standalone, you're looking at your own substation and your own transmission line. That, that, that's an interesting thing, and, and your approach will be different in most respects, but similar in others, right? So remember, uh, a these batteries have their own uh, protection system components. They have their own panels, they have their own breakers, they have their own devices, right? So um, one of the important things to understand, right, is, is whether you're going to be tying into the same switch chart 
in this case now this is for new construction if you already have something that, that's existing that, that's already a moot point and that ship has sailed now it's a matter of making sure you have the correct evidence to show that you adequately tested all these devices and you have an adequate test cycle uh which is periodic right in your procedures baked in right now if you're building something new in this case then your decision your your decision you're making will impact you know how you how you operate this, this system nothing wrong with either one right you can install one of the things i've seen they, they they've installed a, a a battery set to a power plant that thing i think it was like a 20 megawatt capacity and uh i'm sorry a 10 megawatt capacity and this battery set was was really used for black start and was really innovative and helpful and uh this allowed to to do grid forming operations now once the uh once the combustion turbines that were attached to that same bus were up and running that battery set then became load to balance that those combustion turbines output and then they had the little island at that point and then they were able to build their grid from there next slide please okay so commissioning dates very important in this case when you go commercial when you're out there producing uh setting power officially that's when we, well, that's when you have your uh, commercial operations date or your cod date right and it's very important to actually have uh have the, those dates and uh, clearly identified because at that point right you have your whole um your testing period periodicity come into effect whether it could be every year every five years every six years every 10 years right it is very important to actually have that very well coordinated in this case right um the other thing is is, is uh whether you, you commission the whole site you commission parts of the site that's another thing that will also affect when you're able to carry out testing testing and when you will carry out testing so very important thing to understand these are uh, commercial dates so we, we, when you go commercial that's your official commissioning date in this case next slide please 11. Okay, the rating scope in this case right uh one of the things that's very interesting in this case is like you gotta remember it went from 75 megawatts down to like 25 uh and in this case now you're 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 put you're pushing out um, megawatts uh that if if you have been commercial for a while and now all of a sudden this threshold moved beneath you now you're suddenly uh of course it also need to be connected to a 60, 60 kv or above now all of a sudden you are you are uh subject to these standards right so in this case um one of the things to consider right now if you're deciding to build facilities that are going to be limited to uh, under this threshold that's up to you but remember in the future uh NERC and FERC may decide to actually change this threshold once again so you can be operating four or five years from now and everybody decided to just build facilities that are right beneath this threshold and then decided to go ahead and you know move the folk, the goalpost once again now you're back into the same situation you are now so uh again uh things to understand when you install these facilities to your existing facility you may need to reevaluate you know how this impacts your output whether it's bars or how you support the the uh the voltage in this case okay the other thing here, the last one that we're talking about is PER006. And this is important regarding uh, generating facilities and the personnel that operate those facilities. So in this case, for example, if you already have a generating facility and then you're just adding this BESS, you may need to uh, update your training and uh, let, let, the, let them know how that facility will impact the bulk electric system. Uh, if you if you already have a generating site with personnel, you should have already had this training done. So just a matter of updating it and to let them know what adding this new battery storage system will, will, will do and what impact that will have on the system. If it's a brand new site, then of course you know you need to train and educate your operators on how the operating operation of this battery site or disturbances can have an impact on the book metric system. So in this case requires, for example, a lot of coordination and planning and to understand right how they will they will have an impact on the on the grid that they're connected to. So uh this is pretty much it. Last slide. Uh and then um if you have any questions, feel free to leave uh some comments below on the on the uh on the uh on the video or feel free to uh, look us up on HSI or email me directly or send me a message. We'll be happy to answer them. So again, a, a little short one. We had a similar uh, video a few months ago on, on, on what was looming. And here it is, uh, as, as we grow closer, we're already looking at this particular standard. 
So uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, uh, go ahead, like and subscribe. And I encourage you to ask questions and add comments so we can follow up on the, anything you have questions with. All right, thank you so much and have a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.